Hello and welcome to Salute Your Sports. I'm Kamenenchev with Tom Castleman. We are ready for a huge, huge, huge show. It's our Super Bowl special, baby. Uh, one of the best shows of the year every year. Look forward to this. Uh, believe it or not, last year, Tom, we both got the Super Bowl prediction correct. We'll see this year. It's definitely a total toss-up. Uh, I think ESPN's got it at like 50-50 according to their FPI or whatever they want to call it. <laughs> uh, but we'll break down the whole game. Offense, defense, special teams. Who's got the edge in intangibles? Who's got the coaching edge? Ultimately, who's going to win the big game? Who's going to get the MVP? Uh, a lot of good stuff coming up as far as the Super Bowl. We'll have a little brief chat on the NBA. Uh, trade deadline yeah. going down. Kevin Durant to the Suns. Kyrie Irving to the Mavs. The Nets team has been obliterated, although there's a, a certain guy, Cam Thomas, isn't bad either. But my goodness, uh, that was probably the most failed, uh, you know, super team we've ever seen. I mean, they barely played together, uh, Harden, Durant, and uh, Kyrie. Obviously, King James set the NBA scoring record this week as well. We'll hit on that. Uh, overall, can't wait to get started. Huge week for Mahomes. Huge week for the Chiefs. I'm wearing the red. Let's get it started, Tom. Uh, how are you doing today? I am doing fantastic. Super Bowl Sunday cannot come soon enough as typically happens as we get closer to the day with that off week with, with media availability, the big media show on Monday. There's just a bunch of people who are now starting to talk all kinds of different crazy. I think one guy out of Philadelphia said, if you were to build the perfect quarterback, Jalen Hurts checks more boxes than Patrick Mahomes. Maybe if I do enough backflips and bend and twist, Maybe. and I am not flexible Maybe. at all. Maybe I can understand the argument. But in short, everybody is ready for this game to happen. It is filled with storylines. You've got yes. Kelsey versus Kelsey. You've got Andy Reid going up against his own team. Or his old team, you have Nick Sirianni going up against his former employer, Andy Reid. I believe, is it A.J. Brown and Willie Gay Jr. were high school teammates. Mm -hmm. Now they're going to be opposite each other. Brown, a wide receiver uh, for uh, Philadelphia. And Gay, I believe, is a defensive back for uh, Kansas City. Uh, mm -hmm. So we might even see them matching up one-on-one -on -one a little bit. Lots and lots of ex exciting storylines. Also, I mean, pretty big one. First time we're having two black quarterbacks starting against each other in the NFL. Cut like about a decade, half ago, we had two black head coaches facing off for the first time. John G. and Lovey so, Smith. All sorts of really, really fun storylines, but none is more exciting uh, than the game itself. Uh, so you missed common, one storyline real quickly. Which one? Cheese steaks versus barbecue, baby. What's yes. better? There, there's uh, there's two stations, one in Philly, one in Kansas City that have uh -huh. a bet going on. And okay. it's whoever wins, you're either getting Joe's uh, Philly cheese steaks or, or <sighs> Joe's KC uh barbecue Can so we have whoever... both? <laughs> you know I mean, i've never i've never had a phil like i've had a philly cheesesteak sandwich but i've never had like a philadelphia cheesesteak never so I, yeah i've had kansas city barbecue but gotta try out the kc cheesesteak with a philly together philly is, seems like a pretty nice city to visit especially if you're big into history yeah. uh of course so lots and lots of great storylines to dive into we're going to jump right into offense. This is going to be probably uh, the most fun part of the game to talk about because we have a uh, best player going MVP, second time in his career, Patrick Mahomes, uh, going up against Jalen Hurts, who's taken a little bit of a different route to being a Super Bowl quarterback as a second round pick. Started out as mostly, you know, a rushing first quarterback, and people weren't really sure how he was going to develop as a passer. He has developed into a pretty good, if not really good, passer, uh, and he's on the big stage for the first time in his career. So I think there's going to be some nuance within this conversation coming, but better offense, where are you going on this one? Yeah, here's the interesting stat, by the way. If you add up the regular season and the postseason, these two teams have scored the exact same number of points. They mm -hmm. actually have the exact same record. They've got the same amount of all pros. I mean, on paper, this is about as even as a Super Bowl matchup as we've seen in, quite frankly, maybe ever. I mean, one and a half point betting spread. Uh, so I'm going to go with the Chiefs, though. I mean, look, you look at the points per game, regular season, Kansas City uh, was number one. I think in the postseason, the Eagles have scored a little bit more, although 
Uh, you know, playing the Giants does help you put up some points. That's for sure. Uh, so uh, the Chiefs, though, you look at the regular season, bigger sample size, uh, first in the NFL in total yards, first in passing yards, first in points per game. Tough to argue against that. The Eagles, by the way, though, third in total yards. Uh, so Kansas City has, without question, the better passing attack. You know, Mahomes, Kelsey, and company. Uh, obviously, the Eagles, though, have the better rushing attack. I mean, Miles Sanders finished fifth in the league in rushing yards. Uh, Jalen Hurts, one of the best running quarterbacks in the NFL. Uh, he's fantastic. Uh, so a little bit of contrasting styles. It's not to say that the Chiefs can't run the ball because they can. Pacheco is very good. It's not to say the Eagles can't pass the ball because they can. Hurts is a proven passer. A.J. Brown's been really good. Devontae Smith. Uh, but obviously, if you look at what is each team's biggest strength, their go-to, Kansas City gets the edge in the passing game. Philly gets the edge in the running game. Uh, overall, Kansas City a little bit more explosive. I mean, as good as Jalen Hurts, A.J. Brown, you know, Miles Sanders are, you look at the best players on the field, quite frankly, whether it's offense or defense, to be honest, it's Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey. And they have the mastermind coach of Andy Reid, uh, Biennemi as well, drawing up those plays. Uh, Kansas City just finds a way to do it. And I'll say this, Tom, Kansas City has a lot more depth than the Super Bowl team from a couple years ago where they mm -hmm. lost. And we talked a lot about the they had the big stars. You know, uh, they had two uh, pro bowlers. Is my speaker good? I'm sounding good, right? I think I was on Yeti the whole time, right? Yeah, there's a little change, but you're good. Okay. Want to make sure my little speaker has been on and off. But um, I'll say this, though, as I was just saying, the Chiefs uh, offensive line improved from that Super Bowl two years ago. They had two pro bowlers on the offensive line. They have a ton of depth in the backfield. Uh, you know, Pacheco, uh, they have McKinnon. Uh, obviously, Clyde edwards Lair. I think he's activated for this game, I believe. I don't know how much of a difference he might make, but mm -hmm. uh, I think this Kansas City team, to me, is a step up uh, from the one a couple years ago overall. I know they're missing the Cheetah, uh, but I like Kansas City's offense in this game. They really have no weaknesses. Philadelphia, while they are a good passing team, Jalen Hurts' his shoulder is a little bit of a concern. He hasn't passed for tons of yards in the playoffs. So ultimately, I got to say the Chiefs do have the edge on offense, although it's obviously not enormous. Uh, two very, very good offenses. Yeah, it really comes down to, I think, a little bit of nuance because you can say like offense as a whole, but really, as you were pointing out, there's a big difference in how these teams get the job done. And I think probably the biggest and most significant uh, you know, difference in this game, and you know where I'm going with this uh -oh. one, is the offensive line. The Eagles have not one, not two, but, but three all-pro players. That is to say that at three positions along the offensive line, they have the best guys in the league this year. I know Kansas City has invested in their offensive line, but when we look at from the offensive perspective, what's the difference between going up against, say, Cincinnati or going up against Jacksonville's offensive line? The Eagles are truly a step up in class. And we've seen, you know, Chris Jones, I know I'm talking a little bit defense, um, you know, have a big impact on games. But the way that the Eagles run the football and pass protect, that's going to be significant. They're going to need to because, you know, as you mentioned with Jalen Hurts' uh, shoulder injury, that's going to fall a little bit in intangibles, I think, uh, later on in the yeah. game. But better offensive line for Philadelphia, like you said, deeper, better running game uh, for Philadelphia. Um, but then the passing game, I think that's an advantage for Kansas City. I, I think probably in total, Philadelphia has better weapons for Jalen Hurts. But as, as we're talking Mahomes. about two quarterbacks going up, going up against each other, Patrick Mahomes is leaps and bounds better uh, than Jalen Hurts, not to mention Mahomes has been here before. He has done this before. Um, he has supreme confidence in himself and in his guys. And we've seen just how uncoverable, you know, Travis Kelsey can be where you can game plan for him. But as you've mentioned, he's such a smart player. He knows how to find the little pockets in zone coverage. He knows how to leverage off man coverage to make himself open, even if it's not necessarily the way a play is drawn up. There is a special connection here between Kelsey and Mahomes. We've seen it between, you know, other great quarterback receiver duos, you know, Aaron Rodgers, Jordy Nelson, or Aaron Rodgers, Devontae Adams. 
they have that special level connection. That's going to be something that's really key. So I think it's a slight edge to Kansas City because Mahomes is playing so well. We saw him with an ankle injury. I know it was called a high ankle sprain, but in listening to different medical people, you know, kind of talk about it, really it was more just your garden variety ankle, Dr. which means Tom. his mobility is not really that much of an issue. Uh, and especially when it's, oh, hey, he's going to be in the pocket. He has the most passing touchdowns from the pocket this season. So it's yep. not as if yep. his lack of ability to to be super mobile is going to be an impediment on his game. So because of the quarterback, because of that special connection to the tight end, and because a pretty good offensive line, not necessarily Eagles level offensive line, I'm going to give a slight, slight edge to Kansas City on this one. I think in total depth, Philadelphia is better, but Mahomes makes up that difference, uh, I, I think, more than enough. Yeah, I completely agree with everything, pretty much everything you said. I do think you're selling the Chiefs line a little bit. Again, a little bit short, two pro bowlers. Uh, Philly does have a few mm -hmm. offensive linemen that are banged up. Uh, I think they'll play, but obviously remains to be seen yeah. if they're going to be 100%, because that is uh, definitely a difference in the game. And actually, I don't know if you saw uh, this quote by Travis Kelsey. Uh, he was talking about, like, they asked him, why do you find a way to always get open? You know what his answer was? Hmm. Andy Reid. So a lot of these plays, they're actually intentional. They make it look like they're intentional. He's out there, like, supposedly blocking, and he slips out and makes a play. I mean, part of the offense, too, is, like, uh, football is the one sport where coaching matters more than any other sport. There is more strategy involved in football than any other sport. And part of the offense is Andy Reid. I mean, the man's a genius. The man is an offensive genius. Uh, Patrick Mahomes' intelligence is greatly underrated in addition to that skill. Now, you put Andy Reid, Patrick Mahomes, and Travis Kelsey, who I've said on the show multiple times, is the smartest non-quarterback uh, offensive player in the NFL. The guy, I mean, he used to be a quarterback at one point earlier, like mm -hmm. in his college career, then transitioned to a tight end. Uh, those three guys in the same room, you give them two weeks, good luck. Good luck. Absolutely. Well, that brings us to the defensive side of the football where I'm just going to come out and say, I think that as close as it is, you know, parsing Kansas City versus Philadelphia on offense, I think it's pretty clear Philadelphia is a better defense than Kansas City. Not to say that there isn't talent on the side on that side of the ball for Kansas City, but if you look at uh, different sack, sack rates, I mean, rushing the passer is going to be a huge one. The way that Philadelphia lines up with that five-man rush, forcing you to go one-on-one -on -one and getting matchups for their guys. Uh, here's a little uh, a stat called a sack rate. And if you look at the sack rate in the NFL this year, Philadelphia first at about 11.5%. Uh, and then three points lower, you have the second best team, New England. OK, so that's the difference between one and two. The next three percent difference is between England at eight, New England at eight point three one percent. And then you have to go all the way down to Jacksonville at twenty eight. So the difference between the first and second best team in sack rate is the same as the second and twenty eighth best team uh, in the NFL this season. Quite simply, the defensive line is where this is going. This game's going to be decided. The offensive line versus defensive line matchup because it usually is if Philadelphia. Right? If Philadelphia is going to to be able to force, you know, quick throws, and then if uh, you know linebackers are going to be able to rally to the ball, if they're going to force Patrick Mahomes to play a short field game, pretty much all day long. If they're going to be able to get some hits on him, I mean. Philadelphia's defense knocked out not one but two quarterbacks. I mean, obviously, that's kind of like a freak incident thing against San Francisco, uh, but that's indicative of how dangerous their pass rush is and how often they're going to be able to get to the quarterback. So I think that Kansas City is going to have to have a really good game plan as far as finding those quick outlets, those quick relief points and really being picky and choosy about when to go deep because I don't think that Mahomes is going to have a ton of time for those sorts of plays. I think it's going to be very, very strategic how they're able to do that throughout uh, throughout this game. Um, I mean, Philadelphia's defense is just replete with talent at all the different levels of the field. And while I think Kansas City, again, has a good defense, I mentioned that statistic sack rate, Kansas City was fifth in the NFL 
but that's a pretty huge delta between the best and the fifth best. I think that's going to be a really key matchup in uh, in the Super Bowl. Yeah, you're going off sack rate. I, I'm going off total sacks. I think Kansas City was third in total mm-hmm. sacks, and they certainly sacked uh, Joe Burrow quite a few times in the AFC Championship mm-hmm. game. Uh, look, uh, Philadelphia's pass rush is no question the best in the league. They had by, four, by far the most sacks, and they had four guys who got 10 or more sacks. Kassan Reddick, Brandon Graham, Javon Hargrave, Josh Wett. They have Fletcher Cox as well. Uh, so their defensive line is phenomenal. It is a very interesting matchup, though, because we talk about sack rate. Kansas City's offensive line is one of the very, very best. I think I might have seen – there's different metrics to measure it, but one of the metrics, they were actually number one uh, in pass protection in the NFL. Part of that is Mahomes mm-hmm. running around, yes, but his offensive line is very good. That's why in the previous segment, I, I, I mean, I agree with most of what you were saying, but I think you're selling Kansas City's offensive line – very, very short. They are such a great offensive line. It's kind of like a weird matchup because we have an amazing O-line against an amazing D-line. Then we have Kansas City, an amazing passing team. And then the Eagles have an amazing secondary with Darius Slay. and. Uh, so it's kind of like strength uh, versus strength uh, there. So uh, it is very, very interesting. Uh, but, I mean, look, uh, Kansas City is kind of weird on defense uh, in that they play better the second half of the season. If you look at the cumulative stats, yes, Philadelphia has the better numbers. But you look at the second half of the year, it gets a lot closer. Kansas City allowed 40 points total against the Bengals and Jaguars, two of the best offenses in the NFL. Chris Jones is fourth in the NFL in sacks this season. Uh, Mizzou Tiger, guy used to interview Nick Bolton, second in tackles. Uh, So I think this Kansas City defense, again, I've watched this Kansas City team for the last five years. Every single year, the Kansas City defense, the first half of the season looks mediocre, nothing great. If you were going to add up the second half numbers for the Chiefs over the last five years, I don't have the exact stat on this, but I'm willing to bet that they are pretty darn close to a top five defense in the NFL in the second half of seasons. So while I do agree Philadelphia might have a slightly bigger edge on defense, than Kansas City does on offense. I don't know if that makes sense. I'm saying, like, the gap between KC and Philly offense is, like, KC here, Philly here. Defense, it might be, like, Philly here and KC a little bit lower. But I think it's much, Mm. much closer uh, than you or most of the country think. I think Kansas City, uh, the second half of this year has been great. And part of that is all those young defensive backs in the secondary. It takes some time for some of these young guys uh, to get adjusted. So I think Philadelphia – simply because of the defensive line, excuse me, has to get the edge. Although Chris Jones and Frank Clark are not bad either. Uh, So give me the Eagles Mm -hmm. with the better defense, but I think it's much closer than you or the country thinks. This is really an area where, you know, the average fan will identify as a strong point, an area where Philadelphia is clearly better. Like, I'm not, they're, they're clearly better, but they're not much better is what I'm trying to say. Uh, my point on defense. Yeah, no, that all makes perfect sense. And that kind of leads us into, you know, better coaching staff on on this side. I mean, we've gotten a great defensive coaching performance out of both Jonathan Gannon for Philadelphia and Steve Spagnola, of course, for Kansas City. And then on offense, I mean, Andy Reid, Nick Sirianni, both of those guys specialize in in that side of the ball. Of course, you have Eric Bieniemy as well as the offensive coordinator. So, when we're talking about the coaching matchup, where are you going on this one? Uh, we got, we're going to do the special teams as well. But the coaching matchup, mm. uh, I think this is, for me, this is probably the biggest edge of anything, uh, any matchup. Like, bigger than the defense. I think Kansas City, to me, has the clear advantage. That's no disrespect to Nick Sirianni. He's an excellent coach. But Andy Reid's. Been there, done that. He's come off a bye week. We know his record in the bye weeks is ridiculous. He's been in the Super Bowl before. Uh, I mean, he he's literally like a role model for Nick Sirianni. Uh, Andy Reid is so, so smart. And if you ever listen to the pay, uh, you know, the, the Chiefs players like Mahomes and Kelsey, they are constantly saying, how smart is Andy Reid? How smart is Big Red? He's got the second most playoff wins all time, by the way. Tied for the second most. Uh, Biennemi is a very good offensive coordinator as well. Uh, I know Sirianni's done 
great things in Philadelphia. They've got their scheme down. Uh, I do feel like Kansas City has the ability to adjust a little bit more. Uh, Philadelphia's got a pretty simple game plan. Uh, they focus in on running the ball, play action, passing, uh, get ahead, etc. cetera. Uh, I know the Chiefs are a passing team, but they have shown in certain moments that they can run the ball. They have shown that they're willing to adjust, actually. They used to be an aired out deep offense. This season, a lot more of the short passes, a lot more of the quick passes, which is what we'll expect with, you know, Mahomes' maybe ankle not being 100%. Uh, I think for me, the Chiefs have uh, hands down uh, the better coaching staff. This is for me the biggest area, maybe other than quarterback, which is, I think, again, the Chiefs' pretty big edge of quarterback. Uh, but if we're looking at overall units, Kansas City definitely has the edge when it comes to coaching. Yeah, I glossed over special teams, which we'll touch next. Um, I completely agree with you. You said the phrase, been there, done that. That's literally uh, the second thing that I have written down <laughs> when we're talking about the Kansas City Chiefs. The first, of course, being, you know, we talked about this uh, earlier in the playoffs, Andy Reid on a bye week, um, giving him extra time to prepare. And, I mean, these guys, they know exactly what they're doing. Kansas, uh, you know, Reed doesn't have just the experience in Kansas City. He also has been to Super Bowls with Philadelphia as well. So uh, I think, yeah, clear edge to Kansas City. We saw Steve Spagnuolo dialing up really, pretty good defensive calls against mm -hmm. Cincinnati in limiting them in what was a really, really close game. And then if we look at the flip side, uh, that game between Philadelphia and San Francisco was way closer than it should have been with everything going on early in the game before Brock Purdy was even uh, really knocked out. And even when he was and Josh Johnson uh, was the uh, the backup quarterback coming in, it felt like what Thanks. Philadelphia was doing on defense was keeping the game close for an offense that just quite frankly wasn't really humming. I don't know how much of that was Jalen Hurts coming off of a game the week before with the shoulder injury because he had the bye week, played great against the Giants, and then struggled against a, a much better San Francisco defense. But I also I wonder if, if taking some hits was a bit of a problem. And they just seemed kind of clunky and, and disinterested in actually trying to win the game and go for that early on in the contest. Um, so I don't know how much of that is coaching, how much of that is Nick Sirianni calling the game a little bit tight and getting bailed out by that exceptional defense and getting bailed out by the fact that for about the last third or so of the game, San Francisco didn't have a quarterback, quite frankly. Nope. Uh, so I think that's something where, um, you know, Nick Sirianni, like, he just might be kind of like nervous. He's, he hasn't been here before. So he doesn't really necessarily know what to plan for, what to expect with the Super Bowl thing. There's a ton of added pressure that you have to kind of learn and navigate how to handle. Kansas City has done that before, and I think will continue to do so. So I think that's a significant edge for Kansas City as well. Um, moving into special teams, I mean, we've got, you know, pretty good punt games and kick games on, on both sides. I don't necessarily know if they're – is an edge per se? Do you see one for either side? Well, very interesting. These teams are uh, actually very, very bad at defending kick and putt returns. Like, very bad. There's actually, a, I don't mm -hmm. know exactly everything this guy looked over. I didn't have a fully uh, ability to grasp everything that he looked at, but there's a, a guy, Rick Goslin, who used all sorts of, like, metrics counting, like, your punt returns, your, uh, you know, defensive returns against the punt and the kick. And actually, he came up with the formula saying that, again, this is not fully foolproof, but it can't be this far off. The Eagles 31st in the league in special teams, the Chiefs 32nd. So this is actually <laughs> two of the worst special teams, if you believe this guy. Uh, they are not particularly great uh, at defending, nor do they get a ton of the return touchdowns, return yards either. I mean, Kansas City, uh, you know, for the longest time, they had Dante Hall. At one point, Tyree Kill was returning kicks and punts. Sky Moore had that big play in the AFC Championship game. But I'm trying to remember off the top of my head the last time Kansas City returned a kick all the way. It just has not happened in a while. Uh, so these are actually not very good special teams, teams both. Uh, I'll say Kansas City has the edge for me because. Harrison Butker had an off season this year. 
He is statistically fourth all time in career percentage. I'm sure it's not, you know, that high uh, when it comes to extra points, but uh, that's his kryptonite. But uh, he was very good in the AFC Championship game. Again, speaking of been there, done that, Harrison Butker has been in these big games. He has the Super Bowl. Uh, so I just, I like Harrison Butker. He's got a huge leg. Uh, this will be, what is it? It's a stadium where they might close the, the roof. They might have it mm-hmm. open. Uh, either way, pretty favorable kicking conditions. And for a guy with a big leg, uh, that could be a big advantage. A guy that might make a 50 something yard field goal. Uh, so I'll go Kansas city here, but. Uh, according to the advanced metrics, which I did get into a little bit, but not as much as I would have liked to, it does appear that neither team is very good at special teams. So maybe like whether they're a touchdown uh, or perhaps a uh, huge, huge return uh, that sets up good field position, uh, that could be a massive, massive difference. Yeah, I think it's pretty much a wash for me on the special teams front. I mean, we saw like a the really significant play in that Cincinnati Kansas City game was Sky Moore returning a punt that in part was because uh, Cincinnati's punter simply outkicked his coverage. You know these teams are going to have to be really really smart with how they are going to handle this sort of thing because every yard is going to matter. I mean the difference uh, between Sky Moore returning a punt twenty something yards and setting up pretty good field position for Mahomes with thirty seconds to go as opposed to a fair catch somewhere you know farther back on the field that vastly changes what the game could have ended as in uh in that very key matchup in the uh the AFC title game so that's what's going to come down to I think Harrison Butker having a little bit of the hips with with mixing extra points could be significant uh because that's going to then put pressure on your offense to have to try to score in two point conversion situations and I think I mean, I don't know how much you want to say this is special teams versus coaching in general. I mean, the Eagles go for it in on fourth and short situations and plus territory more than just about anybody else. So how significant is their kicking game going to be when all throughout this season, Nick Sirianni has said, hey, fourth and three, fourth and two, fourth and one versus, say, a, a 50-yard field goal give or take, that's going to be a sort of significant thing too because Jake Elliott certainly has the leg to make those those kinds of kicks, um, but it's going to be that decision almost and that kind of ties in with with coaching and how much that's going to matter in this game. Um, that's going to have a huge impact as well. So I agree with you. I think it's pretty much a wash on my end because both of these teams are so poor uh, <laughs> at special teams coverage. Sure. Uh, that really it's going to be who gets lucky with a broken play, who's going to have uh, that one outlier that's going to change the course of field position, change the course of the game. That's a really tough thing to to predict, I think. So uh, I'm going to call it a wash at this point. Sure, that's fair. All right, so that leads into t- intangibles. I, I like special teams kind of falls under that category for me as well but what do you think is going to be kind of the not necessarily statistical thing that's going to have a big impact on this game yeah i mean for, first and foremost i think uh some of this we can't truly determine again i looked at the injury report kind of glossed over it uh mccall hardman likely out for the chiefs at receiver mm-hmm. it does look like juju smith schuster Kadarius tony will play how close to 100 percent are they that matters Again, Eagles offensive line is banged up. Looks like most, if not all, of these guys will play. So that's an intangible uh, that comes to injuries, which is kind of interesting because uh, although maybe Kansas City's receivers are not necessarily great, they are a big part of what they do. Mahomes obviously makes them way better. Kelsey and Reed obviously make them way better. Uh, But the Kansas City receivers are such a big part of what they do. Uh, as is the Philadelphia offensive line. Uh, so that's an intangible that we truly can't gauge until we see them playing on the field. Uh, but overall, my gut feeling on intangibles, this is, again, a pretty big edge for Kansas City. Uh, this is, what, their third Super Bowl in four years. Uh, they know how – I know when the Eagles won the Super Bowl a few years back, uh, almost entirely different team. Uh, there's a few guys that are still there. And they can, you know, provide that experience, provide that leadership. Uh, but a core of Kansas City's team uh, that played in the Super Bowl two years ago, three years ago, 
is still there. A lot of them are still there. Uh, obviously, the coaches have all been through it. Uh, they know how it works. And I think – I know it's kind of maybe overhyped in some way, but I think, like, having the guy in a game like that, that's kind of an intangible in itself. Like a one-game scenario, having the best player in the world – you know where I stand, uh, Tom. I think Mahomes is mm-hmm. the best player to ever play in, NF- in the NFL, the best quarterback to ever play. Uh, obviously, to be the GOAT, you need longevity. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and say that, uh, you know, Mahomes is the GOAT today. If he retires today, uh, Brady's still the GOAT because he's got all the accolades. But to me, assuming Mahomes stays healthy uh, in 10, 15 years, he's going to be the GOAT. He's the best player I've ever seen this play the sport. The off-angle throws he makes. Yes, I know. People will say Matthew Stafford, Aaron Rodgers, they've done those type of things. Not to the same degree. Not the same consistency. Not the same amount of times. Uh, That's an intangible in itself. You've got the leadership of the best quarterback, uh, the best coach, uh, maybe in the NFL, certainly one of the best coaches in the NFL today, maybe ever in Andy Reid as well. Uh, And the simple experience they've had in the Super Bowl. Uh, heck, they even played in that same stadium earlier this season, and they looked pretty good uh, pounding the Cardinals. Uh, so I got to go with Chiefs. The other op- other thing about intangibles, though, again, we've got the ankle sprain for Mahomes, uh, and we've got the shoulder for Jalen Hurts. Which mm-hmm. quarterback is more healthy? Again, we're not going to know until they get on the field. Uh, but overall, the experience of Kansas City uh, and the leadership of Kansas City, for me, I got to give intangibles edge to Kansas City in this matchup. Yeah, I'm going Chiefs with intangibles as well because of their experience in this big Saint ga- big game situation. Um, they simply know what to prepare for, as I said earlier. And I think as far as the intangibles go, I feel more comfortable with Mahomes playing, even if he still is dealing with some lingering effects of an ankle sprain. I mean, he's proven that he can deal with that sort of thing. Uh, whereas Jalen Hurts looked pretty good in that game against uh, New York in the divisional round, did not look as good against San Francisco. I mean, part of that's, you know, on San Francisco having as ferocious a defense as they have, but there's also something to be said for the fact that Jalen Hurts just did not look very comfortable in that situation. So I think the Chiefs have the intangibles on the injury front. Um, It's going to be interesting to see. I mean, McCole Hardman going out, I know he's not like a super duper important player given the depth that they have at wide receiver, but um, you know, who's going to step up? You've got Marquez Valdez Scantling. He was great in the You've got AC Sky time. Moore. You know, th- those are the guys that are going to have to step up and make plays beyond Travis Kelsey because we all know that Philadelphia is going to be keyed in on limiting Kelsey because I don't think it's possible to stop him. They're right. going to be keyed in on limiting him. So who's going to take advantage of those one on one matchups on the outside? I think that's an intangible factor. And then, you know, health on the offensive line. I know Lane Johnson for Philadelphia is banged up the all pro right tackle. You know, how are these guys going to be able to grit through the biggest game of their lives, arguably biggest game of their lives? I mean, both both teams oh, yeah. have a lot of players who have won a Super Bowl before, uh, which kind of takes a, a little bit. It makes this, the story, especially for like the Kelsey brothers, a little bit more palatable, a little bit more fun. The fact that they both have a Super Bowl ring, that one isn't denying the other of this you know, lifelong dream. Um, but I think that's going to be a key thing. It's just injury. It's it's health. It's who's going to come up with a better game plan uh, within the first 15 plays of the game, for example. I mean, Kansas City had a hook and ladder within their first 15 where Kelsey caught the ball and tried to lateral it back to Jarek McKinnon. Uh, you know, who's going to come up with that surprising little wrinkle? Are we going to see another Philly special? Are we going to see some sort of fun trick play because these guys are so creative? Um, I think that's going to be a lot of, of fun stuff to see, but intangibles go to Kansas City just because they're going to be more comfortable with this sort of situation. They've been here so many times. The Eagles, it's impressive that they were here with a completely different head coaching staff, different quarterback a few years ago, and they're back again already. It's going to be interesting to see how they deal with the pressure of this game. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Well, All right, it's so, the so that, that time. brings us to that. That, yeah. uh, that seminal moment of who's going to win, what's the final score. I think in total, we've both given uh, more points, so to speak, to the Kansas City Chiefs. So where are you going with this one, Common? 
You know uh, well, where going, I mean, but. come on, let's let's be real. You know where I'm going. I think anyone who's watched our show before probably also knows where I'm going. Uh, this mm-hmm. is the same place I'm going that I went with before the season started. To be fair, I typically pick the Chiefs every year, and it's because I think overall, up and down, you know, they're the best team in the NFL. They're small margins, but going into each season, if I had to pick one team to win it all, it's Kansas City. I mean, I didn't trust Buffalo because they hadn't proven it to mm-hmm. me. So I was all aboard Kansas City uh, going into the season. I'm going to stick with the Chiefs. Uh, I've got 27-23. It's going to be a close game. One thing we didn't talk about as an intangible that I probably should have mentioned uh, is very interesting that Kansas City is an underdog. The Chiefs, Tom, are an underdog in this Super Bowl. They were actually – am I cooking out the audio or is it okay? Mm-hmm. A, a little bit, but you're good. Okay, I'm going to get a new court here for next week. But um, <laughs> they are the – underdog in this Super Bowl. They were actually the underdog in the AFC Championship game. I know, I think they technically ended up being a slight uh, betting spread favor, but more people bet on the Cincinnati Bengals than the Kansas City Chiefs to win. Almost the entire country is betting on the Eagles when it comes to states. If you look at bets placed across each states, uh, I think like it's Kansas and maybe it was Missouri, the only two states uh, back in the Chiefs, which makes sense, right? Uh, so uh, that's mm-hmm. an intangible in itself. Patrick Mahomes is sitting there saying, oh, I'm on the underdog. You guys don't believe in me. I'm the best player in the world. I mean, come on now. Uh, so the Chiefs, for me, have the two best offensive players in this game, Mahomes and Kelsey. They've got the best coach in Andy Reid. Uh, they have a lot of depth that we haven't talked about. Really solid depth at the running back spot. They go three deep. Their offensive line has been very good this season. Two pro bowlers. Uh, Their defense, they've got so many young defensive backs. They had a big injury in the AFC Championship game, and the young defensive backs stepped up. Uh, This team has lost Tyree Kill from a couple years ago, uh, but overall, up and down the roster, uh, they are rock solid. But for me, this simply goes down to Patrick Mahomes. He is the best player on the field, number one all-time playoff passer rating Regular season passer rating, uh, most passing yards per game in the regular season, most passing touchdowns per game in the playoffs. It's not just the stats, though. It's the stats and the it factor and the eye test. I mean, he checks off every single uh, check mark. I think he's going to be ready for this game. I think he's going to play so good. I think a superstar is going to carry his team. Uh, The ankle sprain, they say that he's better, and he actually moved around when he had to last game. Moves around fairly good. So with two weeks, I I only think that he might be healthier than Hurts going into this game. Again, that's just my guess. Uh, But I think that Mahomes is going to carry this team. Uh, Him and Andy Reid together these last two weeks, they've been salivating. I think they're still upset about uh, that Super Bowl loss a couple years ago. They're still upset about the Bengal loss last year. Uh, This team's playing with the sort of kind of edge. And you saw how upset they were about the Bengals and Burrowhead. And all this, you better believe these guys are upset that they're the underdog in a Super Bowl. I mean, look at this. The last five years, they're now playing in three out of five Super Bowls. You're telling me these guys are the underdog? I know it's a slight underdog, but come on. Uh, Mahomes gets mm-hmm. it done. Uh, he he, you know, gets a second Super Bowl championship. Uh, Chiefs win. It's going to be close. I don't think it's going to be a blowout. Uh, but 27-23 is my score prediction. I'm going with a score of 24-23 Eagles. You know, we couldn't go for a clean sweep across the board for Kansas City on this one. I mean, I'm taking shades of that Tampa Bay Super Bowl against Kansas City years back where we said, hey, you know, Tampa has all these different advantages and key units on the field, whereas better quarterback for Patrick Mahomes. And that was even with Tyreek Hill, a really reliable receiver on the outside. And Tampa Bay, with a phenomenal defense at all levels, was able to mitigate a lot of that and really make Patrick Mahomes uh, look human, look not great as a quarterback in that game. Uh, I think the Eagles' defense is primed for a similar level performance. And not to say that Mahomes and the Chiefs can't overcome it. I'm just going to rely a little bit more on defense. Um there's this guy that I follow on, on Twitter. His name's Scott Lindholm. 
pretty good follow if you're looking for some, you know, statistical analysis. What he did was he took, I think it was like 76 or 78 defensive categories and like made a big composite number. And going back to the year 2000, that Super Bowl, that was the uh, Baltimore Ravens and the New York Giants, the team with the better defense won two out of three of the Super Bowl. So about a 66% clip. So you could even say that I'm playing the math. Not even that, the no, that was Niners that, won. that was an exception, but the Tampa Man. Bay Chiefs won. That that fell the rule. So the team sure. with the better overall defense, and there's a fairly significant, you know, again, seventy different statistics. Again, I'm not going to go through each and every one. I'll say this though, Tom. Up, but uh, I think that the rule changes we've had just within the last five years are much different. Mm-hmm. The game from 2000 to 2015 yeah. is is very very different. Uh, so sure. I, I, I don't know. I call BS on that stat because, uh, the 2000 <laughs> Ravens were playing much different, uh, type of ball than the two, 2022 chiefs. Uh, as far as that sure. goes, I'd almost look at stats from the last five years and I don't have them off the top of my head, but I feel like the last few years, I mean, look, the chiefs beat the Niners. Uh, we had, I mean, Rams, Bengals, I guess offenses were pretty close. Uh, but you look at all the teams in the last few years that have been in the Super Bowl and won the Super Bowl. I know the Bucs were great on defense. They were great on offense, too. Uh, sure. So, I don't know. I'm not, I mean, the I'm Eagles not are great, great on offense this year. They are. They Eagles are. are great on offense as well. Yeah, I'm going for a close game. I'm going for a one-point score, you know, whatever okay. you want to bet on the margins. So, you want to bet you're gonna as pick, it can be. You're going to pick the Chiefs to cover the line but lose the game. Isn't that hilarious? Because it's plus one and a half. Something like that, yeah. Oh, something like so that. funny. Isn't that hilarious? <laughs> that's so funny, man. I mean, I mean, that's really what I think this game is. I think it's it's a, a one point type of game. I mean, I know obviously there's several different outcomes that we could see, but in terms of looking at these two, you know, these two talents on both sides of the football, it's just sure. I can't go more than one point type of thing. Um, MVP, I think uh, we're probably going to be same position on opposite teams in that case. I think it's going to be Jalen Hurts, and I'm guessing you're. You're going to go with Patrick Mahomes simply because these guys are so involved, are so a big a part of mm-hmm. each team's offense. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, if the Eagles win, keep an eye out for Miles Sanders. He's been really good in the playoffs. I had really him written player. down too. So Miles Sanders has a decent chance at it. If the Chiefs win, it should be Patrick Mahomes. Uh, but I'm going to drop in a name that I think is going to be great in this game. Kadarius Toney. Mm-hmm. Uh, the man is a super talented guy. Uh, He hasn't been in the Chiefs' offense that long. They have utilized him with some trick plays. I think with two weeks, Andy Reid's got some ideas. Uh, I look for Kajarius Tony to have a big game. Uh, Sky Moore, he might emerge as well in this game. Uh, But I think Mahomes wins the MVP. Uh, And I think, to be honest with you, the other thing to me that sticks out is, uh, look, Patrick Mahomes statistically in the playoffs is the best quarterback of all time. Uh, but the Super Bowl, his numbers have not been out of this world. I'll admit that. Now, part of that last Super Bowl against the Buccaneers, his teammates dropped two touchdowns in the end zone. There was a drive where they had to settle for three, and then they went for fourth down and got a turnover on downs. So, sure, you know, he's played two Super Bowl games. He adds two more touchdowns to his stats. They look a lot better. Uh, but mm-hmm. he's been he's been good in the Super Bowl, but not great for his standards. I think that uh, this is going to be one of those where it's the law of averages. Uh, Patrick Mahomes uh, plays about 80 to 90% of the games. He plays great, not good. Great. The fact that he hasn't played great in either of his two Super Bowl games. uh, I think the law of averages is going to (laughs) show off to Patrick Mahomes playing great in this game. Like the best player, uh, that he is. Uh, so I think he's going to be the MVP, uh, but it'll be a good game. I think if the Eagles win, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, Mr. Miles Sanders get the MVP. Isn't the law of averages also known as the gambler's fallacy? Moving on to the NBA, we've got oh, some gosh. major trade deadline news. Okay. Um, I mean, there's there's tons and tons of trades. Uh, busy past couple of days, it was hard to keep up with everything that's going on, especially myriad three and four team deals and swapping five second round picks we'll and all sorts of crazy two, two stuff. Things. But we're going to focus 
on the two biggest trades as the Brooklyn Nets have ultimately decided going for a super team filled with unreliable play is not the wise decision. In particular, Kevin Durant saying, yeah, I'm going to my wagon to Kyrie Irving because that guy is known for one thing, and that's reliability and availability to be certain. Um, Kevin Durant now finds himself in Phoenix, which I believe was his preferred destination over the summer uh, when there were kind of talks about uh, making that trade. He made a trade demand, but ultimately uh, agreed to come back and play for the Nets this season. He now finds himself out in the desert. And then Kyrie Irving ending up in Dallas, giving Luka Doncic uh, his first, I would say, true superstar teammate. I know that they made a move. The Mavericks made a move for Kristaps Porzingis. In my mind, he rose to the level of star, but not superstar. Agreed. So this is kind of a different level of, of mm-hmm. thing. So, you know, going over those trade deadline moves, we'll go with the biggest one. I mean, the best player available for trade uh, was Kevin Durant. He now ends up on the Suns. The Suns did not have to send back uh, Devin Booker, CP3, or DeAndre Ayton. But they did have to lose some key depth guys, some really good 3 and D players. That was kind of part of their identity and how they reached the finals uh, themselves. So with Kevin Durant over that really talented depth and honestly also really good health that Phoenix had with those players that they traded away, do you see the Suns as a favorite out of the West now? It's a loaded question. Right? <laughs> uh, so. Yeah. First off, I will say there's no clear, like, clear-cut favorite, no team that in either conference I am betting against the field. It is 100% wide open in the NBA. Obviously, how do these guys fit is a legitimate question mark. Uh, the, the real question mark is the health, though. Kevin Durant has had a lot of injuries in the last few years. Look, if you told me, and CP3, by the way, has had some injuries. Devin Booker's had injuries mm-hmm. this season. If you told me Kevin Durant, Devin Booker, Chris Paul, and DeAndre Ayton will stay healthy, all four of them, the rest of the season, I'd probably tell you the Suns will win the championship. Now, am I convinced that will happen? Not at all. Uh, Because, look, they lost pretty much all their key role players. I believe they lost two starters, but they were role player starters, another key bench player. And they traded away just about, like, a a ton of their draft picks in the coming (laughs) years. Uh, Phoenix, obviously, Chris Paul is on the way down. Still a very good player, but he won't be around that much longer. Kevin Durant is still amazing, but surely in the next few years, he'll slow down a little bit. Uh, This is kind of like a win-now move. I know Aiton and Booker are young, but Aiton and Booker alone will not win you a championship. So Phoenix is going for this now. This is their window. The next two years, they either get a championship or, uh, honestly, this is kind of labeled as a failure because in two years, who knows what happens. Uh, They have, like, zero depth right now. So, ironically, Mm -hmm. Kevin Durant is kind of in almost the same spot he was with the Nets. Uh, It was going to be, look, if Harden, Irving, and Durant all played and they fit well together, the Nets were going to win the championship. Uh, they did not all play. All the guys missed numerous times. They had moments of fitting, moments of not fitting. Uh, but that was a disaster with the Nets. Uh, so it is very hard to, uh, you know, say like this isn't like when Kevin Durant went to the Warriors because, uh, you know, Devin Booker is not Stephen Curry. As good as Devin Booker is, he's not Steph Curry. Uh, honestly, given where CP3 is now in his career, given where Clay Thompson was maybe five years ago. Clay might be a better player than CP3. Uh, the Warriors still, they lost a bunch of role players, but they still had Draymond Green. They still had Andre Iguodala, guys who were key role players on that team. So this is not like the Suns aren't at the level of that Warriors team when Durant joined them a few years back. I want to make that clear. But Mm -hmm. it really goes down to Durant and Devin Booker. How are these guys going to coexist? Because, yes, one's a shooting guard, one's a small forward, but they're both more perimeter players. While both can pass, they both can be unselfish, Durant especially, uh, but they're both kind of that alpha dog on the top scorer type guy. CP3 is going to have no issues with these guys. CP3 is happy to pass the ball. Uh, He'll be fine. 
Uh, if Durant and Booker click and they stay healthy, they'll win the championship. If there's any sort of injury, even to DeAndre Ayton, even if DeAndre yeah. Ayton, the fourth guy on that team, gets hurt, uh, they'll probably come up short. So right now, I'll say they're a slight favorite. They are a slight betting favorite. If I had to pick one team, I'll pick them. But I have very, 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 very little confidence in that pick. Yeah, I mean, as long as you have the collection of talent that Phoenix has, you have to say that they're a favorite and just kind of build into that the fact that injury and, well, and age is going to be part. Are they a favorite or the favorite, though, is the question, Tom. Like, if you had to pick I'm one. I'm going to say, if I had to pick one, I, I mean, I'd take the field over the Suns type Right, of I thing. agree with that. So, so yeah, like, I, I'm okay. In that case, I would say no, they're not the favorite for me because I still okay. like teams like the Denver Nuggets, the Memphis Grizzlies, who have homegrown superstars, which allow them to contend at a level Grizzlies where they have prove both. It. The, the, well, so they both the have to prove it. So do the both Nuggets. teams have to prove it, but yeah. they both have superstars augmented by really good depth as opposed to looking at these two trades with, you know, Mavericks and Suns where, yeah, they get that second superstar, but at what cost? You know, I'm kind of going to tie these two things together. I'm looking at both of these teams. I don't know who the stopper is defensively on on both ends. I know that, Mm -hmm. you know, Booker and Durant are capable defenders, but they're going to be asked to carry a huge load on the offensive end. Same thing uh, for uh, Irving and Doncic. And though, you know, Doncic isn't even necessarily considered that great of a defensive player himself. I mean, note that he does the best that he can, but he doesn't have the the pure athleticism that you need. He puts in good effort, but there is just his style of game works really well on offense. You kind of have to hide him a little bit on defense. And when it comes down to playoff basketball, slower pace game, there's a lot more half court sets. Both these guys have guys that can get shots. That's going to be where they have to make up that difference because on the opposite end, like I said, I don't know who's going to go out and be a stopper going up against another team's guys. So I, I would say that, no, the Suns aren't a favorite at this point. I think they're more of a favorite than Dallas is uh, simply because so who's you know, the favorite? Durant. Who's Pick the favorite team. for me? I'm going to stick with Denver. I'm going to stick okay. with Denver. I mean, I had them preseason. I'm going to continue to have them. Um, and as of right now, point differential backs that up out of the Western sure. Conference. They have the highest point differential. Uh, Memphis is the second highest. Obviously, with these moves, we're going to see a shift. You know, Dallas Mavericks uh, and both Phoenix Suns, they're both positive. And I'm certain, or not certain, I would say there's a decent chance that goes higher. It's just like you said, it's health. It's going to be rest. It's going to be making sure that these guys are available and good to go in the playoffs. So I'd say neither team is a favorite right now. I'd say that the Suns are a legit contender. I don't know if I have that same belief for the Mavericks, though. What are your thoughts on them? So, I mean, look, the thing about these specific, all these moves, uh, it's a different game because it used to be back in the day, you power, like you get your big two. One's like more of a center. One's more of a perimeter player. And mm-hmm. you do like a pick and roll. Even like, even though Anthony Davis isn't a traditional center, you know, he's got a good mid-range shot, which works with the pick and roll. He's still more of a guy who's a little bit more down low. LeBron is more on the perimeter. Uh, and that's how they paired and they won a championship. Sometimes when you pair these guys that essentially play the same position, it gets a little tricky. I mean, look at Jason Tatum and, um, you know, obviously Jalen Brown. They kind of play the same position. Uh, you know, you look at like LeBron and Wade, they did end up winning but maybe they didn't win as much as people thought they would. They kind of played the mm-hmm. same position. Again, Durant, Booker, CB3, all perimeter players. Durant, Harden, Kyrie, all perimeter players. So it's like, it's a little different. Like when you get yourself like, like for example, LeBron playing with Clay Thompson. LeBron will face a double team, kicks it out to Clay Thompson. They fit perfect together. Uh, Durant and Booker are still a little bit different because they play different positions. But Kyrie and Luca played the exact mm. same position. That's where it gets like a little tricky. Uh, because in especially Luca, Luca is so used to uh having the ball in his hands all the time. Uh, is that gonna help him maybe get a little bit rest, stay a little bit fresher, or is that gonna be where he loses rhythm when Kyrie has the ball a lot of the time? Uh, so it is very, very tricky. I mean, I think. Look, Kyrie Irving 
has the potential to be a top five player in the NBA when he's healthy, when he's focused, the guy's amazing. Uh, they're both amazing players, uh, but I don't know how they're going to fit together. I just don't. I don't because it feels to me like they're still going to have two guys, at least with the Suns, you have CP3, which you have to respect his shot. Uh, he's still a pretty capable offensive player, even if it's not his main thing. Uh, but like Kyrie and Luka could still get double teamed and someone else is going to have to knock the shot down, you know? So it almost feels like mm -hmm. in some ways they'll be taking turns in Dallas. I know they have a decent player in Christian Wood more down low, uh, but it's hard to say. It is very hard to say. Uh, if we get the best version of Kyrie Irving, uh, the Mavericks, sure, they have a chance, but they don't have a lot of depth. Again, they gave up depth to get Kyrie Irving. So uh, I kind of see Dallas's ceiling uh, as making the conference finals, which I think would you know, they did it last year. They had that upset of the Suns, but that's probably their ceiling. I mean, it's a pretty even field. Things could go their way, but I don't see this like Luka and Kyrie. They're the favorites. I, I think they improved, mm -hmm. although they improved if Kyrie plays. Uh, I don't think they're the favorite, though. I think the Suns definitely the biggest winners at the trade deadline, even with all those draft picks. Look, Phoenix, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if they've ever won a championship, certainly not in recent yeah. years. Uh, so Phoenix, I don't think so. No, uh, for, for them, you know, being a top seed, you know, making the finals, that means nothing. They're at that stage in their franchise. CP three is at that stage in his career. Devin Booker's a young guy who's hungry. Kevin Durant's got the legacy. I mean, it's championship or bust in Phoenix. They make the finals and lose. That is not a good season because they just made the finals and lost a couple years ago. Uh, so I think that Phoenix is in the best spot. Dallas, I mean, it's again, Dallas, it's worth a gamble. Why not? Like, that's been the question mark. Luca's never had a star. It's worth a gamble. You know, with Kyrie Irving, you just truly never know, though. Yeah, I think that um, I trust Kyrie Irving, uh, as weird as that might sound, no, uh, to play along weird. with Luka Doncic because, I mean, we saw basically LeBron James is kind of like a point whatever position you want to call him. And Kyrie was able to play off of him. Uh, in that NBA Finals where, you know, LeBron brought one to Cleveland. I think that a uh, a big thing with it, though, is that LeBron James was at the time established as the best player in the game. And while Luka certainly is great and certainly is talented, uh, Kyrie's kind of gotten, I don't know if the phrase like too big for his britches kind of comes into play, but he certainly sure. left Cleveland, left LeBron James going to whether it's Boston or, or going to the Nets and, and basically saying, I am the guy and coming up multiple times and showing that he, he isn't the guy that he is a phenomenal, you know, Robin, if we want to use the whole Batman Robin metaphor, um, sure. it's going to be interesting to see if he has the same deference to Luca in Dallas that he had to LeBron in Cleveland, because I don't think he really had that for Kevin Durant. Uh, in Brooklyn. And so it's going to be really interesting to see how they kind of play together like that. Also, you know, Luca having is, is a really effective player with the ball in his hands all the time. How good is he going to be as a catch and shoot guy, which he's going to have to incorporate into his game, I think significantly more than he did before. I uh, move or the best kind of outcome for Dallas in this sense is that you can now kind of almost stagger Kyrie and Lucas so that you always have a ball dominant shot creator on the floor. Uh, which is something that Dallas struggles with whenever Luca has missed time with injury or simply needs to take a rest on the bench. You now have a reliable guy in Kyrie Irving who can pick up some of that scoring It'd load. Terrible so, without him this year, just terrible. Yeah, so so I, you know, bringing in Kyrie Irving certainly shores that up. I think that, like you said, conference championship seems like the ceiling for Dallas. I don't necessarily know if they even get to that point. Looking at the standings. Mm -hmm. They're currently fourth. I think this move helps keep them in kind of that home court top four position, uh, mm -hmm. which is kind of critical because you look at that home and away record, 19 and nine at home, 11 and 17 away. It's going to mm -hmm. be significant for Dallas to have home court advantage over some of these other teams like, say, the Clippers, who are kind of even with their home and away records. Phoenix Suns, actually, 
almost exactly the same, 19 and nine at home versus 11 and 18 on the road. So it's going to be interesting to see if they're going to push up the standings uh, just a half game back at Dallas of that key, key fourth spot. And of course, a half game ahead of the Pelicans for that first play in game, that seven spot. So a lot of interesting stuff in the NBA. I know we've been football heavy uh, all season long. Of course, next show we'll be recapping the Super Bowl, but also taking stock of where we are in the NBA in much, much greater depth. I uh, just wanted to make sure we touched on these massive moves at the trade deadline uh, for the NBA. That brings us now to betting locks. Uh, comment if you could give the recap and also somewhere along the lines, I messed up the overall standings. I have one more outcome uh, than I should have. So that means I either have one more win or one more loss. I got you at 19, uh, 19, and myself. one. 19, 19, and one. Okay, Does that sound let's right? See. Is that is that divisible by three? Because I was. Uh, yeah, that's that's thirty nine. So that's thirteen. So thirteen okay. weeks since we started doing the new picks. Thirteen, thirteen times three gotcha. is, is. Do you have that nineteen, nineteen, and one? What do you have? I had eighteen, nineteen, and one. So I was missing a win. Yeah, we'll get you a Which win, Tom. We'll get you a win. Uh, <laughs> Let's go through the quick, recap. Uh, real quick, too, as far as the NBA. <laughs> Uh, good for the Lakers getting rid of Russell Westbrook. I called that would be a massive failure, and it was. I was right. The man, obviously, very overrated, and he's even more past it than he was. Uh, D'Angelo Russell coming to the Lakers. Look for the Lakers to at least make a playoff spot. Uh, we didn't want to ignore LeBron James in the scoring record. We're saving that for the statement of the week. So I did mention mm-hmm. that off the top of the show. We will address it. We probably could have put that ahead. But I already have that in my statement, so we'll get to LeBron's scoring record. Do not want to ignore that. It's for betting locks. I was 1-2 and two last week. I got the Chiefs winning against the Bengals. They won 23-20. Chiefs, Bengals, over 47 points. Uh, I was wrong, 23-20, just under. What probably would have hit over if the Chief receivers did not get injured and the Chiefs offense stalled in the fourth quarter. Uh, then... 49ers at plus two and a half at the Eagles. You know, this one could have gone either way if not for the injuries. Uh, but lo and behold, injuries are part of the game. Uh, our Eagles cruising easily. One and two week for me. Uh, you went two and one. You had the Eagles covering against the Niners. Uh, you had the under in the Eagles-Niners game, which is one I was eyeing. I backed off. Should have stuck with that. I was between the Chiefs over and the Eagles under. That's the difference between a two and one or a one and two week. And lastly, Mm -hmm. you did have the Bengals to win. You missed that one. So two and one for you, one and two for me. Uh, What you got this week, Mr. Castleman? I am going all Super Bowl props because this is a really fun time of year. I know you and Drew have your coin flip tradition. Uh, I'm not going to pick that that one for locks of the week simply because uh, that is a fool's bet to put money on because you're paying juice either way for an outcome that has absolutely uh, no predictive value behind it. Uh, So for me, I'm going to go with uh, yes at plus 110, plus money Castleman here. Yes, there will be a two-point conversion attempt. It doesn't have to be successful. An attempted two-point conversion in the game. I picked this one in the Super Bowl last year. Unfortunately, it didn't hit. Um, but the Eagles are really good at fourth in situations, really good in short yardage situations, in part because they use a rugby-style quarterback sneak, where basically it's put three guys behind Jalen Hurts, snap him the ball, and just push and shove until he gets into the end zone. I also think that we talked about Harrison Butker missing uh, extra point kicks. Uh, that could be something that factors in where if he happens to miss one, Kansas City needs to pick up two points. Um, not to mention that, these teams are really good on offense, and I think, again, this is leaning more on the Eagles' side. They know they need as many points as possible against Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs. If I need to have a, if I have a lead in this one, I would much rather it be eight as opposed to just seven. So sure. I think there's going to be an attempt in this game. Kind of tying into what I said earlier about the Eagles and fourth and short situations from uh, the plus plus territory, basically on their opponent's side of the field, but not necessarily in the red zone. Uh, give me Kansas City to have the longest field goal at minus 120. Uh, in that area, we've seen Andy Reid go to Harrison Butker for those kicks, and we've seen Nick Sirianni go to his offense to try to convert those. So I think 
for the longest field goal in the game, give me Kansas City. And then I'm going to go with Patrick Mahomes' passer rating under 100.5. Uh, that's at minus 115. It, I mean, there's a reason why Patrick Mahomes kind of like worst games of his career happen in the Super Bowl. It's because he's going up against the very best defense that the NFC has to offer. San Francisco, fantastic defense. That Super Bowl, I think his passer rating was like 78.3 or something along those. A uh, 78.1 against San Francisco. And then you mentioned a couple of touchdown drops against Tampa. Um, but even with that, I mean, 52.3 passer rating. Two touchdowns isn't going to get him up to that number. And Philadelphia is as good, if not better, on defense than both of those teams were in those seasons. So I think that, yeah, he can be very capable of having a great game. I think it's just less likely uh, to go over that 100.5 number. I think that's propped up because he won MVP, because he looked uh, as good as he did on an angle injury. The truth is going to fall somewhere between kind of that 78.1 and 100.5. I think somewhere in the 80s, 90s for his pass rating feels a bit more accurate. So I'm going to take uh, what I hope is good value on the under. Yeah, I'll definitely say he'll go over that personally. But you know how I feel about Mahomes in this game. Of course. Uh, I'm going in all in on Kansas City. I will have three bets all about the Super Bowl. They're all in on Kansas City. I think I, I probably got to hit all three for them to win the game. So why not? Chiefs plus one and a half. Uh, you know, I think the That's Chiefs the money <laughs> line will win. That's what I'll be betting uh, myself uh, online. Uh, but with a point and a half, I feel good about it. I think Kansas City, because of Mahomes, is a slightly better team. I think they've got the more experience, the better coach. Uh, they are more likely to win the game with plus points. I feel great about Kansas City winning the Super Bowl. I, I'm probably going to bet this, honestly, money line. Uh, but for the sake of like making even, our right? picks, I think it's like plus 105 or something. Take so, it, yeah. Plus money. But for the sake uh, of picks, yeah. And for the sake of picks, I'll go plus one and a half. Uh, just, to, you know, for this show. Uh, I like Mahomes over 294.5 pass yards. Uh, he averages more than 300 pass yards in the regular season and the postseason in his career. Uh, I feel like 295. I know it's a great defense he's facing, but that is – such a low number for Patrick Mahomes. Mm -hmm. uh, look, the Eagles might force a turnover. Uh, I feel more, more confident in this than the passer rating, but I'd be surprised if he doesn't pass for at least 295. Uh, so give me that number. Uh, Kelsey over 76 and a half receiving yards. I was looking at his catch total as well, but I'm going to go with the yards. Uh, that is Mahomes' go-to guy in big games. 98 and 78 receiving yards in the two postseason games so far. Averages 86.3 over his playoff career. Look, when we saw that against the Texans a few years back when the Chiefs got behind, it was double-digit cat catches for Kelsey, bunch of yards. Mahomes will go to Kelsey a lot in this game. The Eagles are going to prepare for it, but preparing is much easier than uh, succeeding so I think Travis Kelsey is going to have a huge game. Uh, I probably feel the best about that one of the three, to be honest. I think Kelsey is going to have mm -hmm. a monster game for the Chiefs. So give me Chiefs plus one and a half. Mahomes over 294.5 pass yards. And Kelsey over 76.5 receiving yards. All right. Sounds good. Um, well, in terms of trivia comedy, you want to go, you want to touch on trivia really quickly or jump right into statements? Because I know with the, you know, the statement that you're going to have, it's a pretty significant thing. I think that'll take up some time. Uh, no, let's do sports trivia. You got a trivia? Uh, I'll just ask, All right. I'll just ask one. I had two written down, but I'll ask one. Uh, who has the record for most career rush yards in Super Bowl history? All right. So it has to be somebody who ran a lot, who, was, who went to multiple Super Bowls, but also in an era before it was passing. I'm going to start off with Emmett Smith and the Cowboys. Nope, I knew you were going to guess Emmett Smith first. Not Emmett Smith. Good guess. Uh, let's see. Most rushing yards. Your logic so we'd is have very to go... good, by the way. Yeah, like I would go maybe like Franco Harris with the Steelers. Franco Harris, 354 rush yards. Mm. All right, I'll ask you nice. one quick bonus one. This one go is pretty it, yeah. easy. Uh, I think at least best passer rating in Super Bowl history over a career. Did we do this one last? Is that Bart Starr? Did we do that one no, last week? No, we, last week we did 
uh, second best passer rating in playoff history. Mahomes was first in playoff uh, oh, passer gotcha. rating. It was Bart Starr second in playoff history. Specific to the Super Bowl, what quarterback has okay. the best career passer rating? It's 127.8, which is really, really good. Yeah. Okay. So that tells me small sample size, somebody who only played like one Super Bowl. No. Did not play no. one Super Bowl. Oh, well, I was played my first guess in that case was going to be Nick Foles. Um, no. Would it be Joe Montana? Joe Montana. Yeah. Four never no never lost the Super Bowl. Four four no. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, salutes and statements. Do you have anything, Tom? I do. It ties into what yours is going to be. So if you want to start with that, and then I'll talk about something periphery to that okay, moment. That works. So real quickly before the statement, uh, I want to salute all the NFL regular season award winners. Uh, there's so many. You know, go to ESPN and look them up. Mahomes, the MVP <laughs> is my favorite. I'm not going to sit here listing off names for about two, three minutes. Uh, but I do want to list off some names of some guys maybe – we haven't talked about on the show all year. Uh, that is the 2023 mm. uh, Hall of Fame class for uh, the NFL. So offensive tackle Joe Thomas, one of the best linemen of all time. Uh, linebacker Zach Thomas, linebacker slash defensive end Demarcus Ware, cornerback Darrell Revis, cornerback Ronde Barber, uh, coach Don Coryell, part of that Air Coryell offense. Uh, RIP to Don Coryell. Linebacker Chuck Howley. A defensive lineman, Joe Klecko, part of that New York sack exchange uh, Jets defense. And cornerback Ken Riley, RIP to Ken Riley as well. So salute to all of those guys on their uh, Hall of Fame uh, announcements. Uh, so as for the statements, uh, I know this is like everyone's favorite time to talk about this topic. Uh, and honestly, if it wasn't Super Bowl week, uh, this would probably be the lead in our show. Uh, but I mm. figure, like, you know, start with the most important and with the second most important. Uh, so LeBron James passing up Kareem Abdul-Jabbar for the most career points in NBA history. LeBron did it in less games, by the way, Tom, uh, than Kareem did, less seasons as well for LeBron. Uh, so... It's that ever elusive debate of who the GOAT is in basketball. And it is one of the questions that literally, I kid you not, Tom, has me up at night. Has me up at night just wondering. Because you know this very well. I'm a huge fan of Michael Jordan and a huge fan of LeBron James. You can be a fan of both. You don't have to have one guy you like. It doesn't have to be one or the other. I respect both guys. Obviously, comparing eras is very, very different. Uh, it's hard to gauge for sure. There is no clear-cut answer. Uh, with that said, though, at some point, you got to pick a side. If I'm picking for one game, I'm picking Michael Jordan. Uh, heck, if I'm picking for one season, if I'm picking the prime of their careers, I might even give Jordan the very, very slightest of edges. Uh, but at some point, longevity has to matter. It has to matter. Uh, LeBron right now has the most points in the history of the NBA in the regular season and the postseason. He's second all-time uh, in the playoff assists right now. He's fourth all-time in regular season assists. Uh, in all likelihood, he'll probably finish second in career NBA assists. Uh, we'll see what happens. Worst he can finish is fourth. Uh, first is very unlikely. John Stockton has pretty high number, but in all likelihood, LeBron will retire in his playoff career as first in playoff points, second in playoff assists. He will retire as first in all-time points in the NBA and second in the all-time assist mark. Uh, that is becoming very, very hard to argue, uh, you know, against LeBron James uh, for the GOAT. Uh, he's doing things at his age that no one has ever done. Um, so I am, again, we'll see what happens. If he flops the last two, three years, it's not over yet. It's not decided. Uh, but at this point, you have to factor in longevity. You have to. You simply can't say, look, look, I know MJ missed uh, some time to play baseball. I know he played 
college basketball. I know we didn't end up having as many seasons, uh, but that has to go into it, right? Like we can't just say, uh, you know, if it's this close, like if it was, if MJ was clearly far and superior to LeBron James, uh, I wouldn't care if he had, you know, less years. Like LeBron's got less points per game, but LeBron's got more assists, more rebounds, uh, you know, more blocks. The numbers are pretty close across the board. If anything, they favor LeBron James overall. Uh, so because of the longevity, it's getting awfully hard to say that Michael Jordan is the greatest basketball player of all time. Awfully hard. I know you'll bring up the six championships. LeBron will never, ever be six for six. Uh, but LeBron also doesn't have as many first-round exits either. And you know how I feel about rings and team games. Uh, for me, MJ, you know, hasn't been the GOAT just because he's six for six. It's because he was such a deadly scorer. Uh, he was such a great defensive player as well, which LeBron, by the way, for most of his career, has been great on that floor as well. Uh, so I'm going to say LeBron James, to me, I'm leaning as him as the GOAT because longevity has to matter. Uh, it's, it's very hard to retire top two all time in points and assists both and not be the GOAT. Yeah, well, the thing that I'm going to touch on as far as that kind of conversation goes is that there is that iconic image of LeBron James sinking that basket that pushes him up past Kareem for the, the most phones. points scored. I am going to talk about the phones I because it. I am a big believer in enjoying the moment and living in the moment. Nobody, and this is not just for something as historic as LeBron James scoring the most points of all time. It's for fireworks shows at the 4th of July. It's for concerts that you're attending. Nobody's going to want to look at those videos. Be in the moment. Be present. Experience everything as it's happening live as opposed to through this little screen that we hold up in front of our faces. There's a degree <laughs> of separation to, to that moment. I honestly believe that. Um, I know like if, tech, if the technology existed back when Jordan hit the last shot, uh, against Utah in the finals, everybody would be doing the same thing. Everybody wants to say like, oh, I have this little piece of history, but nobody's going to capture it as well as the professionals do. And I also honestly think that it kind of diminishes the art of storytelling that we have. It diminishes that connection to be able to talk about how we felt, what we experienced, what the overall feeling was, as opposed to, oh, check out this video on my phone, which is not going to look or sound nearly as good uh, as it actually happened, quite frankly. So uh, be present in the moment of, of greatness, you know, stand there, stand witness, you know, wasn't that, wasn't that like the slogan for we the are James? You know, we are witnesses. I mean, <laughs> yes, you know, touching on a little bit of like the whole greatest of all time debate. I mean, there's so many different ways that you can take it and define what greatness is. Certainly one of them is taking the pressure of being the next big thing from the age of what, like 15, 16, 17? It's incredible. Uh, when, when he was coming out of St. Mary's. I mean, he's incredible. I would say I would say he's met expectations. Because I, I think this is what everybody, you know, expected him to be. But, you know, somebody who brought a championship to his hometown team in Cleveland, somebody who won multiple score uh, multiple championships did you have I mean, I know, like high, scoring the all-time leading score though i would say he's exceeded expectation look i mean everyone thought he was going to be say, an all-time great but he's the all-time leading score that's what i'm saying he's exceeded expectations i think i would say yeah if, if you're looking at specific achievements you could say he's exceeded but basically he's met everybody's expectation of being the and next so. person in that conversation with michael jordan i know for like a little bit it was like oh jordan or kobe and we could clearly see jordan over kobe and it was easier to compare them because their games are pretty much identical um but we look at how you know lebron has played and just kind of revolutionized a little bit you know, how much impact one player can have on a game. I mean, you look at the pace of play, he's part of the reason why basketball has gotten, quote, as small as it has, um, because you don't really necessarily need a center. It's more of if you have big wings, and this comes with better nutrition, better training, et cetera, better knowledge of human physiology. I mean, there's so many different things that go into it, but I would say, you know, he's met the expectations that he would be in the conversation of greatest of all time when he was just a kid. I mean, certainly not the same expectations that MJ had 
as he was, you know, cut from the varsity team as, you know, freshman, sophomore and, and going to Carolina and winning a title. Like he certainly came out and people said, oh, this guy's going to be great, but not to the level that LeBron James has certainly had. So I would say like, that's like, like be in the moment, be present with things going forward. I know it's a challenge. I know everybody wants to have that little bit of online clout or what have you. Uh, but be present in the moment of greatness. And and I think that um, I think everyone will be better for it. A uh, couple of things. I'm so torn on that debate overall, uh, as far as the, the whole put your phones away versus not overall. Like I would say, if you go to a game, take like a photo or video, but watch the game. Don't be snapping photos and videos the whole time. But that is such right, a yeah. historic moment that that is a little bit different. Like I'll be honest for you. When I go to a game, I will typically, uh, I went watch LeBron a few years back. I got a video of him scoring one basket. So I can have that video that I put my phone down. I watched the rest of the game. I got videos in the pregame. Uh, so mm-hmm. that's kind of where I'm at with that. Like you could still capture some stuff on your phone, but still for the most part, be zoning on the game. What you're saying makes a lot of sense. But that is such an iconic moment. I can also understand why you would want that specific moment. Maybe you don't need to record every single basket he scored that game. That I 100% agree with. But when he's right there, again, devil's advocate, it's a tough call. Again, Mm -hmm. I see where you're coming from. Uh, But as far as the real, like, finishing up on this GOAT debate, um, look, there is no athlete in American sports history maybe the history of sports altogether that had as much pressure on them as lebron james i mean this guy had cameras in his face in high school uh his games were on espn in high school uh i mean he is such a like a big name in american sports i don't remember a guy ever having this much hype uh around him and uh it really is very impressive what he's done uh, so again, mm-hmm. it's a very hard debate. Him and Jordan are different players. Ultimately, it depends on what team uh, you have. Like if you're drafting first overall, it's not a clear cut answer. You take prime MJ, you take prime LeBron. I look at what else is around your team. You know, what, who else do you have on your team? Uh, so it's not an easy answer. But my point is that uh, the longevity that LeBron has had uh, has to count. Because Kareem Abdul-Jabbar longevity is a big part of his thing uh i don't think he was as dominant as Shaq or as will chamberlain i don't think he's a top two big man uh, of all time but most people have didn't him. he win like six mvps though that's pretty well, dominant that's he played so many seasons but if you look at his like sheer averages like if you take like Shaq's prime versus cream's prime mm-hmm. Shaq's prime was better wilt's career as a whole was better uh so that's 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 what i'm saying you know it, it's Okay. If you're going to say that Kareem is the best center of all time, it's hard not to say that LeBron's not the best player of all time. Because a lot of Kareem Abdul Jabbar's legacy goes through longevity. It really does. Like his numbers obviously are great. There's no denying Mm -hmm. they're great. But you look up his numbers, his career points per game, his career rebounds, they are lower than Wilt. And I think they might be slightly higher than Shaq only because Shaq played. Obviously, very injured his last few years. I know that sounds like an excuse, mm-hmm. but the prime of Shaq's career was better than the prime of Kareem's career. And it's, it's close. Uh, but anyways, I don't want to get too much into that. I have one question for you, Tom. Uh, <laughs> yes. Real quick, no debate. I know we both got to go. Uh, just quick answer. Your goat. I know, I mean, know where you're going to go, but LeBron or MJ? I know you're going MJ. Uh- just do I'm, it. I'm gonna defer to answer. Defer to answer. I'm gonna. I'm, yeah, I'm not gonna. Well, just. I would say Jordan's greatness, LeBron's best. I know it's that's parsing things, but okay. I, I, I think overall narrative around Jordan a little bit more, and also just I'm a Chicago like. Yeah, but the goat can, is the I greatest say, of all time. Like not not the greatest narrative. And then I argue that LeBron's got a better narrative anyway with all that pressure, but I'm talking about the greatest player of all time. Eh, eh I'm not going to answer that. Okay, that's fair. All right, well, that's going to do it for us. Great <laughs> show today. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, talking Super Bowl recap. Uh, believe it or not, we'll be talking March Madness in the coming weeks. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't wait for all that, Tom. Uh, have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much for listening and watching the show, those that do. And we'll see you guys probably next week to talk about the Chiefs Super Bowl championships, the kingdom, baby. See you guys later.